They were so close to finally getting the answers, but still, no Denise. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Denise Flum. Viewer discretion is advised. Denise Flum was born and raised in Connersville, Indiana, and she was born on January 14th, 1968. She was one of two siblings. She also had a younger sister who was about two, yo two years younger than Denise. Denise had attended Connersville High School where she ran track. She was excellent in her academics. She had been the treasurer of, I guess, the science club. She also played basketball and softball and volleyball. She was incredibly athletic and she was incredibly intelligent. Her goal was to actually study microbiology after graduating high school, and she'd already been accepted into Miami University, which was located in Ohio. She was really, really excited about starting that, but unfortunately, she would never get that opportunity. She was a senior in high school, and she was literally just a few months away from graduating. By March of 1986, the, uh, the senior prom was coming up, and she was really looking forward to that. She had broken up with her boyfriend, Sean McClung, about a few weeks or so before this case occurred. So I don't know if she found a new date for the prom or not, but she was really excited to be going to it. it when she broke up with Sean, it, it definitely... It, put her into kind of a, a, you know, a dark place for a little bit, but her family would say that she was starting to become, you know, more sociable again. Denise has had always been a very sociable person. She had a gigantic group of friends that she would always uh, hang out with and have fun with. She got along with so many people. She was well liked. The community knew who she was. And so when this happens, it, it kind of affected a, a, a humongous amount of people. Denise would never even make it to her prom because on March 27th, 1986, Denise had attended a, what was supposed to be a small little bonfire party at this, I guess, on a farm property somewhere near Connorsville. I guess this party after she arrived, it went from being like a couple of people to a whole bunch of people. It was rowdy, it was a you know, big, big party. A lot of people there. Denise stayed there for quite some time, but eventually she had to go home, so she got into her car and she went home. When she woke up the next morning, she realized that she had accidentally left her purse back at the where the bonfire was being held the night prior. Sometime around noon, Denise would call a couple of friends and say, hey, can you ride with me to go get my purse from where the bonfire was? Unfortunately, none of her friends could go along with her. I, I guess she was having some apprehensions about going there on her own. I, I don't really think they know why. I I'm not sure, but... Denise would get into her car before, sometime before 1230 and she would head out to the bonfire area to go retrieve her purse. A neighbor would uh, talk to her for a couple of seconds as she was walking towards her car, but after that, nobody saw Denise Flum ever again. Denise got into her car with nothing. I mean, she just had her keys and that was it. She didn't have her driver's license. She didn't bring any of the essential things she would needed to if she were planning on going away on her own. She brought no clothes, no backpack, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so as a few hours go by, it's now getting into dinner time and her family realizes she's still not home and that's extremely unusual because she was always home for dinner and they just thought this was concerning. So they wait another hour or two before they call police. Police tell them she is 18. She is only been gone for a few hours. There's really nothing we can do. So her parents start calling around to all of her friends that they have numbers for. They're going to friends' houses, seeing if she's there, but nothing. She isn't at any of their homes. None of them had seen her. I think it was like later on that night or early the next morning, Denise's car, which was a 1981 Buick Regal, was found abandoned. 
It was parked along Tower Road. I guess it was just sort of like a one lane dirt kind of type road at the time. There was a barn next to this area where she parked. The car was locked. There was no broken windows. There was no blood outside the car or inside the car. No signs of a struggle within the vehicle. Everything looked completely normal, minus the fact that Denise wasn't there. At that point, police are contacted about this car. They find out that it belonged to Denise Flum, and then they now they open a missing person report. When they asked Denise's family, like, why would she be in this particular area? Her family had no idea. It was not an area Denise really ever frequented. It was far from her home. It was also about three or four miles from the opposite direction, basically, of where she had intended to be going to where the bonfire was to get her purse. So next, the police go to the property where the bonfire was, and they ask the owners of that property, has Denise been here at all? They said no. Has Denise been here at all to get her purse? They said no. And that's because apparently one of Denise's cousins had come by to, I guess they had the purse already. Poor communication, I suppose. And the cousin brought the purse back after Denise had already left the house. You kind of have to, now that I'm thinking about it, like you kind of have to wonder, like, because he got there literally an hour after Denise left. Like if he had just called and said, hey, I got your purse, we're probably in a completely different situation here. I may not be telling this story. Next, police will interview the fresh ex-boyfriend, Sean McClung. They bring him in for questioning just because he's the ex-boyfriend. You know, the relationship ended, everyone was upset. Maybe he did something out of that. He said, he just said he saw Denise uh, I guess the day of the bonfire and last time he saw her, she was alive. A weird thing to say just because no one had said she was dead. Uh, so that was sort of odd. But police didn't really have any evidence that he did anything to her because one, they didn't have her. They didn't have a crime scene. I, I'm assuming they dusted the car for fingerprints. I have to hope they did. I don't know if they, if they found anything. Even if they did, it hadn't linked to anyone because they've never announced, oh my God, we have, you know, a match to evidence. Really soon after Denise disappeared and they, you know, they let Sean McClung go because they couldn't do anything, he moved to Arizona. Then on August 10th, 1988, um, Judy and David Flum, who are the parents to Denise, they got a phone call from someone in Norfolk, Virginia, claiming that this person who was calling was their daughter, Denise. Judy thought this was credible because this girl called the house on a day where Judy was off from work and Denise knew her work schedule. So she's like, oh, okay, this has to be her. She also thought the girl sounded like Denise. There is, you know, I'm sure I'm not a parent, so I can't relate or anything, but I'm sure as a parent, you just kind of want whatever you want to hear and believe what you want to hear and what you want to believe. You know, clinging on to any kind of hope. I, you have to, I would assume as a parent, to just hope that your daughter is still alive. They are able to identify where the, like the phone number and like they found out who it belonged to and where the address was. So they actually drive the 750 mile drive to Norfolk, Virginia to find their daughter. They go to an apartment complex that was linked to the number. They speak to the office officials there at the apartment complex. They find out that the girl who had the apartment where the phone number came from was a 19 year old girl who used to live in Connorsville. When they found this girl in the apartment, she said, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't call you. I didn't call and say that I was your daughter. And then she changed her tune. She said, okay, it was me. It was a hoax. I made it up. The neighbors of this girl had heard her, this girl bragging that she called the parents of Denise Flum and she said, I'm gonna do it again. Almost like it was just fun for her to give this, these grieving parents false hope. And so it was, once again, the case is now at a standstill again. They have gotten a lot of tips. They've gotten a lot of recommendations of people, you know, talk to this person, talk to that person, but all of it led to nothing. They put up a $100,000 reward because usually money talks, right? That might lead something, someone to somewhere, but it didn't. 
In 2014, they are able to take DNA from one of Denise's baby teeth that her parents had saved. They created, you know, the profile. They put the profile in their nationwide database and just to see if it maybe matched any kind of like Jane Doe's that have been found, but nothing. In September of 2018, the police announced that they have what they think is a big break in Denise's case. They said there is now evidence to suggest that Denise Flum was definitely murdered, likely the day she disappeared. They, I guess there was a, an open field type property in Fayette that they believed that she may be buried in. I guess this was the Mary Graybird Sanctuary. They brought in cadaver dogs just to, you know, help search and it came up with nothing. They then brought in a ground penetrating radar. They brought in all sorts of tools to see if they could find a body on this property, but they searched and searched and searched and unfortunately, once again, nothing. Sean McClung, the ex-boyfriend who had moved to Arizona just after this, she disappeared, He's now living back in Connorsville. He is, he moved back in like 2017 or so. They bring him back in for questioning just because they're taking a fresh look at this case and they're talking to everyone again. He says the same thing. Last time I saw her, she was alive and I don't know anything else. Apparently he took a voice stress test that I guess he failed. I don't really know the, how accurate those things are though. I don't, I think they're similar to like lie detector tests where you can't use them in, the, in court. Then in July of 2020, they find out that Sean McClung has now been arrested and jailed for completely unrelated crimes. That gives them the opportunity to kind of dig deeper into his history. They find out that when he was living in Arizona, he had multiple uh, domestic violence charges against him. He had been violent with his ex-girlfriends. So they took this as an opportunity, now that he's in jail, to ask him again. And this time, he confesses. He says he killed Denise. He said he killed her the day she disappeared, in March of 1986. He claims that Denise had picked him up that day as she was on her way to the bonfire property to find her purse. He then says they got into a really big argument, and one thing led to another, and he killed her. And then he asked a couple of his friends to help hide her body, which apparently they did. Sean McClung was offered immunity for whatever reason for this case, but the deal breaker was you, he could not withhold any information about this case, meaning when they asked him, where is she? He was required to answer that question, but he refused. He says, I will not tell you where she is. And so the deal was off the table, but now they know he confessed. And so they end up charging him with voluntary manslaughter. They have not exactly released how he said he killed her. They also believe that Sean McClung made this confession because he's dying. He had a terminal illness that was going to claim his life very soon. And so they think that's why he confessed. But then why not say where she is? That doesn't make sense. If you're confessing to the murder, you know you're gonna die soon. Why not just say where she is? What's the point? Is it just to be an asshole? Like just to be that much of a dick to her family who just want to bury her? That's it, they wanna bury her. They wanna know where she is so they can properly lay her to rest. So why would, like, why? In September of 2020, just about a month or so after he was formally charged with the voluntary manslaughter, Sean McClung died. He never went on trial for the disappearance or murder. And allegedly, Sean McClung had given some information to his lawyer just five days before he died. His lawyer would eventually come out and say that a conversation he had with Sean before he died was that Sean falsely confessed to killing Denise Flum. He said the only reason he confessed was because he thought it would get him out of jail for the other charges. Which, I mean, just to be kind of fair here, that kind of does make sense as to why he wouldn't say where she is because maybe he didn't know where she was because maybe he didn't kill her. Because it just, it just isn't logical for you to say, all right, I'm dying, I'm gonna confess to killing her, this is how it happened, this is when it happened, but I'm not gonna tell you where she is. It just, it's, it's, it, for some reason, that is just like, it's so strange. 
And so maybe that is the reason why, because maybe he just falsely confessed. But there's also the chance that he did actually kill her. There could be a, a couple reasons, maybe, why he doesn't want to say where she is. Because one, he said that friends helped him bury her. And perhaps he doesn't want to release their names. Maybe by revealing where she is, it will point to other suspects in this case. And he doesn't want to get them in trouble. Maybe. That's one big reason I could think why he wouldn't say where she is. Or maybe because of this terminal illness, perhaps he forgot where she was and genuinely just didn't know where he put her. But any information he may have had, if he did have the information, is gone to his grave. Over the years, I know properties have been searched. I know the bonfire property, I think, had been searched and other areas connected to people involved had been searched, usually with not very intrusive searches, like it involves like cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar, and they haven't found anything. Well, I guess there is one property uh, that it's owned by a family called the Johnsons, where the Johnsons are not allowing them to search that property. One of the people who used to own this farm property was a man named Benjamin Johnson, who was friends with Sean McClung. Police have some very, I guess, minor information that Benjamin had at one point confessed, not to police, but to other people, about having knowledge of Denise's whereabouts or where or what happened to her. He himself was considered a person of interest back in the day. Never a suspect, but just someone who had been on their radar. The family has to now file a lawsuit, which they actually did just a couple of months ago in March of 2024, with regards to getting this property searched. They're, they're looking for not only Denise, but Denise's belongings, like her clothing and a ring she had on. This family is just saying, no, you need, you need to like take this to the legal Take this to the courts. Like, come on now, why? If you're not guilty of anything, why? Why? Just let them search. Again, it's not a very intrusive search. They, they want to do a very cursory with dogs and with ground penetrating radar type things, not dig up the entire property unless they have to. So why not let them do it? The lawsuit that the family of Denise Flum has filed, and at this point, both of her parents are now in their 80s, they're not saying they want to search the property in an attempt to determine who may or may not have killed her. They just want to find their daughter's remains. That's it. That the, it's literally in the lawsuit. We're not here to find out who did it at this point. We just want her. But they're making it, this Johnson family, for whatever reason, is making it extremely difficult for them to do that. That's insane to me. That's absolutely insane. Just let them get their daughter back, for God's sakes. Like if it was your family member buried in some lonely hole somewhere, you would you'd want them back. And so it's just, it's just people. Ugh. But unfortunately, that's where this case stands. The main suspect, if he if his confession was true, which it certainly could have been true, is dead. The property that they want to find to see if their daughter is at, which they have a I guess they have a pretty strong feeling she may be there based on the connection to the ex-boyfriend who allegedly killed her, how who was good friends with one of the owners of that property back in the day. They just want to search it to get their daughter back, but that's still kind of at a standstill. And so there is no closure here. They were this close, this close to knowing everything, but it died with that man. However, there still is a chance that somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, knows what happened to Denise, and knows where she is. Perhaps a suspect talked to you, or maybe the person they talked to then talked to you. You know, if you have information, you can report it anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. This is about getting their daughter back home and just laying her to rest properly. That's it. That's where it's at now. They don't think that justice will likely be done. There's a chance it could be, but probably not if their main guy is dead. They just want her. That is all this family is asking, and that's really not asking that much. Just give their daughter back. So if you have any information about the whereabouts of Denise Flum or what may have happened to her, please contact the Sheriff's Department at 765 825-0535. If there is a chance for justice to be done, please let Denise Flum and her family get the justice that they all rightfully deserve. But that is it for this case. True crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry, Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. 
As usual, please subscribe, give this video a like so more people can see it. If you want to follow me over on my TikTok pages, uh, the links to those pages are in the link tree in the description of this video below. They also pop up here. I tell short form true crime stories on two different pages. And also in the link tree, you'll find my merch store. We have like t-shirts and hoodies. We do ship all over the entire world. So feel free to check it out if you want to. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email with the name of the individual the case, where it happened and when it happened, I'll add it to the list. The list is over 6,200 or so names now. I pick my cases that I cover each video at random, so I can't promise you when I'll get to your case, but I will get to it eventually. Yeah, so there's that. But at any rate, that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. So we shall see you for the next one. Ta-ta for now, True Crime Unis. I'm practicing on rolling my R's. How am I doing?